Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our study in the Key Chapters of the Bible. Today we're going to 1 Samuel chapter 24 where David spares Saul's life. Now, the purpose of this study is just to help us understand the overall message of God's Word. And so we're studying a chapter a day, talking about that chapter, what it means, and how it fits into the overall context of the Bible so we can understand the entire message of God's Word together. And so now we've skipped a bunch of chapters and we're dropping into chapter 24 today. And really, this chapter is just a representation of really the several chapter saga where Saul is just seeking to kill David. You'll remember that Saul's motivation about this whole thing here is he's, he's about his own kingdom. He is trying to establish his own kingdom. He's not trying to establish the Lord's kingdom. He wants his own thing. And so he doesn't have the Lord's blessing. So God's not going to bless Saul building his own kingdom. The Lord wants his kings to establish his kingdom. And so the Lord told Saul back in chapter 15, verse 28, that he's going to take the kingdom away and give it to someone who is better. And we know that person is David. Now, David himself is far from perfect. Uh, In many ways, his his own life is a difficult read because we come across these things. We're like, how how does a godly man do that? The difference is that although David struggles with sin, we all struggle with sin, his underlying motivation was to serve the Lord and establish the Lord's kingdom. And that's a huge difference that we can't underestimate. There are so many people in this world who are like Saul. They might outwardly seem like they're engaged in the Lord's work, but ultimately, they're trying to create a name for themselves and build their own kingdom. Maybe they want their own popularity to just grow. Maybe they want their own reputation magnified. Maybe there's some other motivation, but they're using things of the Lord to accomplish their own purposes. That kind of person or that kind of work isn't really going to be blessed by the Lord, or at least not to the fullest extent. Then there are people like David. This is the person we should be trying to be like. They might struggle with the Christian life, but their goal in their orientation of life is to see God's name glorified. They're not about their own kingdom. They want God's kingdom established, not their own. And and they know and they trust that God is a God of forgiveness and grace, and they walk in that forgiveness and grace, and then they just try to do the Lord's work. That's what we're seeing in David, and that's why the Lord blesses David and doesn't bless Saul. Now, with all that as a background, we now come to chapter 24. Yesterday, we spoke about how David had fallen out of favor with Saul. After he'd killed Goliath, the people were celebrating David and not Saul. That really ticks Saul off, and he tries to kill David with a spear twice. Well, David escapes. He makes this beautiful covenant with Jonathan. This friendship is established. And so then David flees Saul, and Saul is just continually pursuing David and just committing incredible treachery. For instance, in chapter 22, David had been finding sanctuary with the priests in a city called Nob. The tabernacle was temporarily there for a little while, and David goes there, and he's just trying to hide from Saul and find refuge. Well, Saul hears about it, and he goes in and he massacres 85 priests of the Lord in retaliation, clearly demonstrating he is not about the Lord's kingdom or the Lord's work at all. Then in chapter 23, David hears that the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, just a a town of Keilah. And so David goes there and he delivers the people of Keilah from the Philistines. That's in verse 5, 23, 5. You'd think that they would be happy with this, but the Lord tells David in verse 12, yeah, they're going to actually surrender you to Saul, so you better get going. And so David and his, his buddies move on out of Keilah and they move to the wilderness of Ziph. But the Ziphites also betray David to Saul. And so David has to move on again. And he moves to the wilderness of Engedi, And that's where chapter 24 picks up today. Engedi is an oasis that's about 35 miles southeast of Jerusalem. It's uh, on the western side of the Dead Sea. There are tons of caves in that area. Some are large enough to hold thousands of people. And so David and his men are hiding in one of the caves in that region. And as the Lord will write out the details, Saul goes into the very cave where David and his men were hiding. Saul goes in and he's going in to relieve himself. And while he is there, the men look to David. They kind of whisper to him, Behold, this is the day which the Lord said to you. Behold, I'm giving you an enemy to your hand. You shall do to him as it seems good to you. Now we're going to come back to that in a minute. But we need to know that there is no record that God has ever said this to David. Just the men are kind of saying this and kind of making it sound flowery and like the Lord has said it. And this is just an example where we need to be wise about the counsel we take from others. So either way, David doesn't kill Saul, but just cuts a piece of his robe off. 
And then in verse 5, David feels bad about this because he is challenging God's divinely appointed king. Saul gets up and leaves. And after he's probably a little bit of a distance away, David comes out of the cave and calls out to him and says, Look, I could have killed you, but I did not. I will not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And he appeals to Saul to stop pursuing him. Saul gives this response in verse 17 that sounds good. He says, You are more righteous than I, for you have dealt well with me, or I have dealt wickedly with you. And he recognizes that David has legitimately spared his life. And he says in verse 20, Now look, now behold, I know that you will surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. And then he asks David to promise to be good to his descendants, and David, of course, agrees. And so there's this temporary reprieve in Saul's pursuit of David. But all of this is not true repentance because Saul picks up his pursuit again in chapter 26. So that's our chapter study for today. And as I mentioned, I chose this as just, a, just an example, one of the example chapters of Saul's pursuit of David. There's several others we could have gone with. When we look at this whole ordeal, though, we can see here this principle that there are times like Saul where we want something so badly we're just pursuing it whether or not God's going to give it to us. We're, we're really ultimately fighting against the clear hand of God, and we just want it so badly we're willing to sin to get it or to keep it. And that's what Saul is doing here. That's what Saul is doing throughout all of these chapters. Remember, Saul has been told by Samuel that he is going to lose his kingdom. Jonathan gave David his very sword, just indicating that he believes David's going to be the next king. Jonathan flat out tells David this in chapter 23, verse 17, that he believes that David will be the next king and that even his dad Saul knows this too. And yet still with all of this, Saul is pursuing David and trying to get rid of David. David's not trying to overthrow Saul. He's trusting the Lord's timing for his own ascension to the throne. He's trusting the Lord, but Saul is clearly not. He is literally rebelling against the Lord and fighting against God and God's man tooth and nail. I mean, that's why he kills the priests and not, because he just has really no regard for what is going to be pleasing to the Lord. And we all have to learn the lesson that to pursue something that's not from the Lord, even if he allows us to have it, it often has disastrous results. We just need to learn to walk by faith and trust God and his timing and his provision and not rush into things and not push for what he has not provided. Along these lines, this passage is also an example that not every opportunity we have is from the Lord. Or even if it is something that God has given to us, maybe the situation might be from the Lord, but maybe not the specific action. It does not give us permission to sin or even to listen to counsel that's really not in alignment with the Lord. When you look at what these men say to David back in verse 4, although it sounds kind of pious and kind of faithful, but upon closer look, we see it's really just worldly, fleshly wisdom glossed over with religious language. Well, thankfully, David sees through their counsel. He disregards it. He chooses a better way, a righteous way. Just an example of how when God provides something for us, we need to be really careful that we don't take that and sin with it, but we still walk in righteousness and faith and obedience, seeking to glorify God. In fact, not all counsel is wise counsel. We could do an entire podcast on how to determine if counsel is really wise, but here's just a couple principles. For instance, wise counsel is rooted in God's Word. Not only is it rooted in God's Word, it's rooted in what that actual passage means. It's not uncommon for people to quote the Bible and cite a passage that sounds good or maybe kind of mush some things together in a way that sounds good, but it's really not biblical teaching or it's not really what that text was meant to say. Learning to walk with Christ starts with just recognizing that God has spoken in this word and it has a clear, specific meaning. We can't twist it to say whatever we want to say. Along those same lines, wise counsel also points us to a righteous obedience and faith. It's not uncommon for people to give us counsel and it's really not calling us to actually obey God and walk in faith. They might be saying things that just we, they know we want to hear. Maybe it's, it sounds good to them or something that they would do. But it's not really calling us to say, you know what? you got to trust God here. Just walk by faith. Trust Him and take His word at, at face value. In most cases, when God is giving us a situation, He is giving us this opportunity to demonstrate His wisdom and the wisdom of His ways and the wisdom of His instruction in His word and what it looks like to trust Him. Usually God's way is going to be hard. Usually God's way is going to require us to die to self. Usually God's way is going to cause us to follow a path of scripture. 
And usually God's way will also show us his wisdom and show the world his wisdom. And if the counsel we receive doesn't accomplish any of that, if it's not really hard, if it's not really calling us to die to self, if it's not really calling a specific path of scripture to obey, if it's not really highlighting the wisdom of God's ways, that's probably not counsel that we should be following. In this case here, David was wise not to take his men's advice and to choose a better way. Finally, this is an example of David's complete and total trust in the Lord and what it looks like. Again, in this situation, David could have taken matters into his own hands and killed Saul right then and there. He would have been justified, right? I mean, certainly Saul was pursuing him. His men wanted him to. But he knows that he doesn't need to take matters into his own hands. He knows that he can trust God. He's not going to take what God has not yet given to him. He doesn't want to sin against God. He, he knows that having God's blessing is most important of all. So he's going to walk with the Lord and trust him and obey him. And although this is not going to be easy for, for David, this, this is not going to be an easy path for him. This is God's path, and he's going to walk with him and trust him in this. So as we wrap up our time together, just a final thought. Is there any area in your life where you are pushing for things that you want that's not clearly from the Lord? Are you just trying to grab something that he has not given to you? If so, why not bring that to the Lord and just lay it before him and say, I surrender this whole thing to you. I want to worship you, honor you, glorify you in this. Give me the grace and the strength to do what you would want me to do. Help me not to grab or take things from you that you have not given. Help me to just trust you and let you be Lord and God and King. And let me just submit my entire life to you. As you seek him that way, he will give you that strength to walk with him, to glorify him, and to enjoy the peace that comes from knowing that we have not taken what God has not provided. We have walked with him and trusted him. And where we are today is where God wants us to be. That's a great peace. And I hope it's yours as you walk with the Lord and serve him and obey him and submit to him. We'll leave it there. We'll pick things up tomorrow. Have a great day and God bless.